I'm Millie Solomon. I'm the president of the Hazden Center. And it's just my great pleasure to, to um, assemble all of us and, and um, reflect on some of the most important things that are going on in the world around us right now. The Hastings Center, for those of you who are new to us, is a bioethics research institute. Our two primary goals are to ensure the wise use of emerging biomedical technologies and to promote just and compassionate care across the lifespan. Our scholars write books, special reports, policy briefs, and articles for health and science journals. We own two journals that publish the peer-reviewed work of others who are in the field of bioethics. And we have a highly developed and very well-regarded convening power. And that's also not something to overlook when I describe the center. Because we're able to bring people together who are uh, very senior policy makers, thought leaders, opinion makers. We purposely try to bring people together who disagree with one another on very important, unsettled questions. And we've developed the capacity to develop nuanced understandings so that people can get past log jams. In addition to our scholarship, we have an equal commitment to public engagement. Um, we do that through online activities and in-person events like tonight's. We're approaching our 50th anniversary soon, and as part of that celebration of our, of our work and our desire to, um, what we're thinking about for the future, we are rethinking and elaborating and developing our communication capacities and our public engagement activities. So stay tuned, there's going to be lots more very soon in that regard. The Hastings Center was founded in 1969 at a time when science was transforming medicine and society. At that time, about three quarters of the way into the 20th century, the major technologies that were emerging were life-sustaining technologies like ventilators and dialysis machines. Um, they were coming online and they were becoming very prevalent. Our founders, Dan Callahan, a philosopher, and Willard Galen, a psychiatrist, recognized that these life-sustaining technologies were going to be profoundly transformative. They were going to change the way we think about life and death. They were going to change the way we think about the purposes of medicine, and even how we view a natural human lifespan. The poster child for these issues was Karen Ann Quinlan, who appeared on the cover of Newsweek in 1976. She was the iconic case. She was a young woman in a persistent vegetative state Everybody agreed that she was not going to regain consciousness. Her parents wanted the ventilator turned off. Her doctors didn't really oppose that, but they weren't sure if that would constitute killing. So they insisted that the parents um, seek a judge, or get a judicial determination. And that case was the beginning of what became a worldwide debate about when and how it's ethically and legally permissible to withdraw treatment and allow death. That's not only a debate about quality of care, it's also a debate about technology. When to use it and when to step back. So in a way, it very much relates to the kinds of technology questions we're going to be looking at tonight. The Hastings Center was at the forefront of that debate, and we ultimately developed the guidelines that have become the norms for end-of-life care across the United States and in many parts of the world. But here we are, well into the 21st century. And today's technologies are far more transformative than ventilators and dialysis machines. They have the capacity not only to extend the life of a single individual, but also to transform the very nature of the human species and to shape not only currently living people, but future generations in perpetuity. There are many such transformative technologies right now. Yesterday we held an event on artificial intelligence and the intersection of advances in information technology with, with life sciences advances is extraordinary. So there's many such technologies, but tonight we're going to zero in on advances in genetics and genomics. And in particular, we're going to look very specifically at the intersection between um, assisted reproductive technologies and genomics, an area that scholars refer to as reprogenetics. Reprogenetics is the use of genetic information and genetic technologies 
to prevent or to ensure the inheritance of particular genes in an individual. Uh, the Princeton biologist Lee Silver once pointed out that we humans have always practiced reprogenetics. And anytime we size up a potential marriage partner um, and we ask ourselves, would I want to have a kid with that person? That's a form of reprogenetics. Um, so you could say whenever you go on Match.com or you sign up for It's Just Lunch, you're doing reprogenetics. You could also say that someone is practicing reprogenetics when they use many of the internet sites that, uh, where it's possible to look for optimal sperm donors. Or when prospective parents respond to an ad for a $50,000 egg because they're looking for the genetic traits that they see embodied in that egg donor. But Match.com notwithstanding, tonight we're going to talk about more standardly understood um, re reprogenetic technologies. And there are three main kinds. Um, the first one is pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, PGD. In PGD, a DNA analysis is performed on a single cell <coughs> of an eight-cell embryo. In order to detect which of several embryos may have a genetic anomaly that the prospective parents want to avoid then only an embryo without that anomaly can be implanted, as a PGD. Prenatal genetic testing, most of us are familiar with amniocentesis or chorionic villus sampling, um, and more recently, fetal genome sequencing. These prenatal genetic testing technologies aim to detect genetic anomalies during fetal development, and they provide information so that parents can make a decision about whether to go forward with a pregnancy or to plan ahead for the birth of a child with a special condition. So PGD, prenatal genetic testing, and the third, which is very much in the news and I'm sure in the room, <laughs> is gene editing, where a gene or gene sequence is removed and replaced with a different variant. Now, we've been doing gene editing in the lab and in plants and animals for decades now. Um, we've successfully edited the genome of mice and pigs and sheep, for example. But the refinement that occurred in 2012 and 2013 of CRISPR-Cas9 was game-changing. All of a sudden, gene editing became much, much easier and much cheaper. It's something that people can do in most any molecular biology lab for very little money. There's even do-it-yourself gene editing going on in local garages in Brooklyn, um, uh, editing the genomes of plants and bacteria. With this new ease, the prospect of human gene editing, changing our own genes, all of a sudden looked very close at hand. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of this because it's a context in which we're going to be hearing about the writing of the journalists that we're celebrating. Um, it became so close, in fact, the prospect of human gene editing that one of the inventors of this technology, Dr. Jennifer Dudna, along with some other leading researchers, called for a moratorium on its use in human embryonic uh, human reproductive cells, in sperm, eggs, or embryos. Now, unlike somatic gene editing, the term somatic is used for gene edits in non-reproductive cells, germline gene editing makes changes to the genes in sperm, eggs, and embryos. It, therefore, germline changes are heritable, they're passed on to one's offspring, and are permanently uh, continue into future generations. In 2015, the National Academy, Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine here in the United States, the Royal Academy of Sciences in the United Kingdom, and the National Academy of Sciences in China co-sponsored the first ever summit on human gene editing. They recommended that germline gene editing of humans should not be done because it wasn't safe, en uh, safe enough to try in humans, and because we had not yet had enough discussions about the social and ethical implications. A second summit took place just, I think, what, 10 days ago, maybe? A week, in, a week and a few days in Hong Kong. Carolyn Newhouse, our, our philosopher on our staff, represented us there, re represented the Hastings Center there. This second summit reiterated the same view, that scientists should refrain from germline modification of any embryos intended to develop into babies, at least for now. The recommendation was, at least for now. The organizers of these, of these summits support 
basic bench research with human embryos, uh, gene editing to learn about human development. But such research, in their view, should not progress to implanting such embryos for development into babies. Now, all these technologies, whether it's embryo selection through PGD or gene editing through CRISPR, raise a similar set of questions. How can we maximize the great benefits of these technologies, and they do have great potential for preventing terrible diseases, how can we maximize that while avoiding potential downsides like devaluing people with disabilities or beginning to think of children as something to be engineered rather than as a gift to be nurtured as they come to us? Another way of saying that is that no technology is neutral. It's how we manage to use it and when we decide to apply it and to what ends that really matters. Think about what we've been learning about the internet, something that we all thought was 100% wonderful. Um, we have to figure out how to manage these inventions. And so we have to ask ourselves, what must be done to ensure that these scientific advances promote and do not diminish human flourishing? So shortly after Jennifer Dudna's call for a moratorium, the Hastings Center received a grant from the John Templeton Foundation. Um, it was with Templeton's generous support that we were able to do a lot of things, including, and I'm about to bring us up to why we're together today, including why we're here tonight. The first thing we did was to convene an interdisciplinary group of scholars to discuss and debate these issues. And a book edited by Eric Perrins and Josephine Johnston is, will be coming out shortly as a, out of the outgrowth of those deliberations um, by, uh, under the imprint of, the, of Oxford University Press. The book is going to assist college students, professors, scientists, and interested citizens in thinking about what's at stake in the gene editing debates. Secondly, we, we have a strong commitment to education and to, to, to involving the public and equipping the public to deal with these issues, but that also means young people. The earlier that young people can be involved in these issues, the better. And so another thing we were able to do under the Templeton Grant for the first time ever was this past summer convene a workshop for high school science teachers to help them teach this material. And we were very excited about that. We had 21 teachers from all parts of the country at our beautiful facility in Garrison. Third, we've worked with journalists, and that's very dear to the, to the, to the DNA, if you will, of the Hastings Center. We, we like to serve journalists. We like to be helpful to journalists. We like it when journalists call us. Um, and what we were able to do under the Templeton Grant was to develop um, conference workshops at, w that were done in uh, collaboration with the uh, membership societies of healthcare journalists and science writers, uh, specifically the Association of Healthcare Journalists, AHCJ, and the World Federation of Science Writers. And lastly, Templeton gave us an opportunity to identify and celebrate excellence in science journalism on ethics and re of reprogenetics. Um, because they enabled us to award three prizes to three outstanding science writers. About 18 months ago, we assembled a first-class selection committee of judges who were independent of the Hastings Center, so they could make whatever recommendations they thought best. Um, our three awardees are here tonight. You're going to hear from I'm going to introduce them properly, and you're going to hear from them in a few minutes. But I want to thank the selection committee first, because they did a lot of the hard work of going through all the nominated materials and making recommendations. Um, Ruth Padawar, are you here? Could you stand? Um, Ruth is a contributing writer to the New York Times Magazine and an adjunct professor at Columbia University School of Journalism. Sorry to surprise you like that. <laughs> but thank you very, very much. Um, Marguerite Holloway, are you here? Yes, thank you very much. Marguerite is, now she knew, she got warning, yeah. She's the director of the Science and Environmental Science Writing Program at Columbia. And the third um, judge was Luke Dow, head of the Dow Lab at Wild Cornell, where he and his colleagues are studying the relationship between cancer and genes. And he's unfortunately was, at the last minute, not able to join us, but he sent his regards. Thank you very much, judges. acknowledge a very long line of um, scholarship on ethical issues in genetics that has been going on at the Hastings Center for decades. In 1993, the center convened scientists and ethicists to address 
very closely related questions to the ones we're going to talk about tonight. At that meeting, I, I, I was going through these archive materials and I saw that Leroy Walters, a philosopher and one of the nation's most thoughtful bioethicists, laid out a very prescient template for thinking about the ways in which genetic engineering could lead to human enhancements, both, or so-called enhancements, both enhancements we would want to pursue and ones that we might want to avoid or even prohibit. Hastings senior scholar Eric Perens, who directs our humanities program, has also been a foundational part of the Hastings lineage in this area. Over more than two decades Hastings, uh, at Hastings, Eric has been writing about enhancement and other ethical issues related to genetics. Eric edited this in 1998. During questions and answers, you can ask him more questions. I'm just going to I'm just going to demonstrate that there's a long lineage here. This is a, a report that came out of one of those convenings I was telling you about in 2004. If I'm getting the dates wrong, tell me later, Eric, not now. <laughs> um, and um, wrestling with oops, yeah, wrestling with behavioral genetics was 2005. And then his latest solo authored book. Um, shaping ourselves. All of these issues that we're going to be talking about today are ones he has been grappling with in very sophisticated ways for a long time. So let me give you a little bit about the overview for the evening. We're going to do three things tonight. We're going to celebrate the critical importance of journalism for enhancing public understanding of these issues and to underscore the role that journalists play. Um, we've invited New York Times columnist and best-selling author Carl Zimmer to talk with us about his science writing experiences. And I'm going to introduce Carl in just a moment. Then we're going to celebrate three particular journalists who won this year's awards, Andrew Joseph, Amber Dance, and Antonio Regalado. And you'll meet and hear from them. They'll each have some brief remarks to make as well. And then the third thing is we will acknowledge the elephant in the room. In other words, <laughs> we'll take the opportunity to discuss the latest remarkable news from China. Despite the Human Genome Summit's strong recommendations against editing any embryos destined to develop into babies, a Chinese scientist, Dr. He, announced that he had gone ahead and edited the genomes of two embryos, implanted those embryos in their mother, and twin girl girls had been born. He released this information just two days before the second Human Genome Summit that I described earlier. Um, in other words, just as the world's scientists were about to gather to discuss the regulation of this practice. Dr. He's claim still needs to be verified, but if it's true, it will be the first time, first known time anyway, that human beings will carry human-made changes to their genome. Lucky for us, the journalist who was first to break this story is here with us tonight because he's one of our award winners. That's just how prescient our judges were. <laughs> Antonio Regalado, and you're going to hear, I've asked Antonio if, if he would um, say a little bit about his winning essay, but say a lot about how he, <laughs> he learned about what Dr. He has done in China. So I look forward to that. So now I'm going to turn this over to Carl Zimmer, but I'm going to introduce you properly, Carl. I want to say a little bit about you, even though you really need no introduction, um, because Carl Zimmer is a prolific writer and speaker, and many of the people in this room are probably extremely familiar with your work, Carl. He's been writing about science for the New York Times since 2004, and he's had his own weekly column there called Matter since, it, since uh, 2013. In addition to the New York Times, he writes for many other publications, including the National Geographic, Wired, The Atlantic, and he hosts a video series for STAT called Science Happens. Let me just sum up by saying he's authored 13 books and two textbooks. And I've just said I'm interested in education, so I'm delighted that the, the textbooks are in there as well. Um, his most recent book, also on genetics, is called She Has Her Mother's Laugh, The Power, Perversions, and Potential of Heredity. The New York Times Book Review named it a notable book of the year. Publishers Weekly picked it for their 10 best books of 2018 and it was selected for the shortlist for the Bailey Gifford Prize for nonfiction. Carl's won many awards. I'm not going to list them all. Um, I just want to mention that he was awarded the Stephen Jay Gould Prize by the Society for the Study of Evolution. And, and he's an adjunct professor in the Department of Molecular Biophysics and Biochemistry at Yale. I asked Carl to speak to the question of why the public should be engaged with these questions and what he's 
learned about some of the challenges of bringing these kinds of complex scientific and ethical questions to lay audiences. So Carl, it's your turn. I'm happy to be here I'm to share um, some thoughts on my own experiences uh, as a fellow journalist try trying to cover this field. <laughs> um, so, um, so Antonio, I have to say, really kind of screwed up my week <laughs> because I thought I was just kind of quietly going on and on, and then Sunday night, like, boom, like something dropped, and I was like, oh, this is going to be busy. <laughs> and um, and so um, the, you know the New York Times was 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 throwing all the resources at this emerging story after Antonio broke it, and then um, I was asked to to write a, a, a kind of a perspective piece for the Sunday Review, um, so I had the luxury of time. Um, and by coincidence, I had been asked to, to give a talk about my book on. Last Friday, I mean, this is all moving so fast. I'm going to tell you what happened last Friday, which feels like a lifetime ago, which is that, um, so I, I live in Connecticut. I live in a charming little town called Guilford. I recommend you all visit it if you do want to go uh, sightseeing. Um, and, um, you know, like I just someone said, would you come and talk to a group, you know, sort of a morning educational talk. So I, come, I went to a group of like about 100 people at our local library. And, um, and I was sort of in, I basically ripped up my talk because it was irrelevant, <coughs> and said, well, let's talk about CRISPR twins. Uh, and, um, and so I've learned, I've actually, so we, we were talking about, like, well, you know, the, the importance for the public to be engaged in these issues. Um, that sort of suggests that they're not, and that somehow we have to pull them in. I'm here to tell you that, like, they're totally engaged. So, like, I, can't, the, I had, like, a hundred people just, like, <laughs> just totally like, totally focused on on the news that I was trying to explain to them. Like, here is uh, Hey Jung Kui. Here's the slide he showed. This is how it worked. We think, um, and um, and I've learned to sort of basically keep my comments short because um, after maybe 20 minutes of stirring the pot, people have questions and comments. And so one of the questions I got, well, I didn't, it was more of a question slash comment. Well, um, someone raises his hand, uh, a man maybe 60 years old, uh, and he says, first, he says two things. First, he says, I carry the sickle cell trait, and my son inherited it from me, and my granddaughter has it, and I would be so happy if we could eradicate it. If my future descendants did not have to inherit that burden. On the other hand, boys of Brazil, <laughs> just like suddenly he throws out this movie <laughs> about this, uh, just refresh your memory, uh, that there was Gregory Peck is this, this uh, um, is in this movie where this, uh, basically, this, this Nazi scientist in Brazil is basically trying to clone Hitler and create this little Hitler army, these, these boys that are Hitler clones. And he's like, I, you know, I'm really worried about that. And that was the sort of the sum of his comments slash questions. And then, then it's back to me to respond. Um, so, so, the, so, um, so the public is intensely interested in this already, but it's really hard for us journalists to respond. I mean, imagine me trying to like respond to that double whammy. Um, and what's interesting is that um, you know I started in science journalism early 1990s. Um, I sort of started writing, but I started in mostly in evolution. Kind of moved my way into genetics, and really at the time, you know, we would kind of talk about these issues, but they felt very far away, maybe impossible. Um, it just maybe. It, People would talk about genetically engineering humans, but you'd say, like, yeah, but how would that really work? Um, and cloning happened, you know, cloning sheep, and then you would have people who would, you would have these doctors who would claim they had cloned humans, and then they would never show you their cloned <laughs> humans. And so we don't think that it ever really happened. So, so it all felt kind of theoretical um, uh, until just the past few years. I don't think anybody imagined that something like CRISPR would turn out to be uh, so easy to use, so cheap, um, although not necessarily so safe. 
Um, and so we're, we're in this situation now where, where things are happening uh, in a way that I don't think we journalists really anticipated. And they're happening at a pace that we didn't really uh, anticipate. Um, and I would say, um, you know, based on, on the talks that I have been giving, been giving it, um, now that my book has come out, I, I sort of am starting to use these, these talks more kind of like surveys to just to find out what people are thinking and understand and how, how they view these things. Um, I don't think anybody understands what's happening. I just don't. I think that people are just sort of like, what is going on? Um, and so that gives us journalists a mission. Like, we, we have a very clear-cut mission right now, is to, to, to explain what the hell is going on. Um, and, you know, there, there are a few clear-cut missions right now in science journalism. One of them is climate change, and I'd say this one is the other major one. These are the two big ones, I would argue. Um, and this is not easy. This particular... Neither one is easy. This one, the problem with the problems with writing about uh, uh, reprogenetics and, and such is that, first of all, the technology is is tricky. I mean, it's it's easy and it's cheap. But if someone says, like, tell me again how CRISPR works, uh, and I've, I've been in this situation, like I'm like you know on a radio show, and someone says, oh, remind us how CRISPR works, and you've got like 30 seconds. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I will confess to you, I can't even remember what CRISPR stands for. <laughs> maybe, maybe Antonio or Andrew has it memorized. I don't. And so, um, uh, so, so we have that burden, um, and we're trying to describe that to an audience that, um, for the most part, I would say, um, had, the last time they really like learned seriously about. Um, genetics and biology was high school, and uh, it, it's my impression that um, largely um, in high school, even until recently, um, genetics started and stopped with Mendel. Uh, Mendel is a great place to start, it's a terrible place to stop, uh, and, and it, it, it gives people a very outmoded idea of what you can do in terms of manipulating genetics. If you think everything is just works like, like these Mendelian factors that control wrinkled peas, then if we start to talk about Alzheimer's or intelligence or all sorts of complex traits, people are going to apply these very simplistic notions. Um, and in my book, She Has Her Mother's Laugh, I, I talk about how 100 years ago, exactly that happened with intelligence. Um, how uh, the United States pioneered a program of eugenics based on the faulty idea that intelligence and quote-unquote feeble-mindedness were controlled by maybe a single gene. And tens of thousands of people were sterilized in the United States directly as a result of this. And in Nazi Germany, they, the people there would quote American eugenicists as evidence of this simple connection between Mendelian genetics and uh, traits like intelligence. Um, I don't think we've really progressed much further in terms of the education, uh, in terms of education about genetics beyond what happened 100 years ago. Um, we're in a situation now where, where, where geneticists are trying to understand how literally thousands of different genes and regulatory elements are all influencing a trait all at once and their influence only matters if you take into account the environment in which they're acting. Um, and I don't really think our audiences are even dimly aware of that. So uh, on top of that, um, I would say that um, there, we have to also deal with the fact that ethics and, and the history of this field are um, not really well understood. Um, they're not. Honestly, they're not really under, very well understood by scientists themselves. Um, I was, I was in the Sunday Review. I drew some comparisons between what's happening now with with CRISPR and mitochondrial replacement therapy, which has its roots in the 1990s when it was a fertility treatment. And um, I had scientists sort of taking me to task for because they were not totally identical, which I never claimed they were. Um, but literally, like while they were they were criticizing me, they were saying, "I had no idea about this. I didn't know this happened. <laughs> this is history that's like 20 years old." Okay, so so um, 
So we have that challenge as well. Um, on top of that, um, you know, we have to be writing for an audience that some of, some of the people in our audiences are people who are like the person I spoke to in Guilford at, at my talk. Someone, someone for whom this is not like a, like a thought exercise. He carries, a, he carries a gene that can cause a devastating disease if it's combined with another copy of it. So this isn't hypothetical for him. This is, this is scary stuff. You have uh, people who have muscular dystrophy, families of people with muscular dystrophy, and other diseases where they are thinking like, well, you know, maybe, maybe we would want this, either as a somatic uh, application or maybe even as germline. Um, and you need to be very, you know, to, to give those people false hope um, would be a cruel exercise. Um, and then, you know, the Boys of Brazil uh, element comes in. Um, so, so whereas, you know, people may have not really, like, been in a class about genetics since they were 15, um, they may have gone to see a movie recently. Uh, and so um, I, I, I have found that, that, that uh, ha having written this, this uh, She Has Her Mother's Lap, I'm amazed at how much that I am asked about science fiction movies. Yeah. So, you know, people will say, like, so we'll be talking about these complicated ethical issues, and people say, like, yeah, but what about Gattaca? <laughs> and that's the question. <laughs> Sometimes they get, well, you, you've seen Jurassic Park, right? <laughs> and I'll say, yes, I have. <laughs> and, and, and what about it? And, and, and really, like, somehow it's like, like the fact that these movies have sort of framed these issues become in and of itself proof of something. I don't know what it is. So, so I, so, so I know that 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 people's ideas about these issues are being strongly framed by by things like movies. Um, I guess most recently, Rampage. So, if you see a giant <laughs> wolf coming down uh, the street here, uh, you'll, you'll know you'll know where it came from. You can blame CRISPR. Um, but but you know, barring that. Um, you know, we journalists, um, we really have a, really do have our work cut out. And I've been trying, you know, as I've been working on, on my own reporting, and then as I read the work of people like Andrew, Amber, and Antonio, um, I've sort of personally sort of like kind of come up with a few um, uh, guidelines, or, or, or just a few things that I think that are particularly important that we as journalists have to do. Um, to get the story straight and to basically help fill that huge gap. Um, I think the first thing we have to do is we have to, to recognize uh, the humanity of the people that we're talking about, that we're reporting on. We're, this is not a hypothetical exercise, as I said before. Um, there, there are people for whom this, this matters a lot. And now there are two little babies for whom this is unbelievably personal. These are human beings we're talking about. This is not a thought exercise. And so we need to recognize their humanity and, and we have to respect it. Um, I think we do have to take the, the dangers seriously. Um, on the other hand, we have to explore the benefits uh, realistically. We can't be giving people false hope. Um, on the other hand, we, we have to explore you know, the possibility that maybe the, these kinds of treatments can really bring actual good. Um, and I think we have to actually we have to distinguish um, between the science and the social context when that's necessary. A question I I get I, I was speaking at Yale literally yesterday and I got this question for the 6,000th time, which is like, I'm really concerned about this. I think this is wrong because what, I'm talking about Chris, German CRISPR editing, because this is gonna lead to, to you're gonna have rich people who can afford to CRISPR their kids and then everybody else won't be able to. And I said, well, okay, um, th that's more, you know, I think you're mixing together CRISPR and our healthcare system. <laughs> you know, we, we live in a, in a health, with a healthcare system which is incredibly unequal. 
And that's a social choice, in effect. So how would you feel if you lived in a, in a, a, in a, in a society where that wasn't an issue? You know, what if the government said, you know, actually, for, from a public health perspective, we'd be better off um, if people wanted to CRISPR genetic disorders out of the kids, that'd be great. You know, we don't have to spend, spend $10 million on taking care of someone with hemophilia because they won't have hemophilia from birth. So let's just, so let's, so let's get past that. What about if CRISPR is free? How do you feel now? Are you, are you okay with it now? You know, I don't think so. I'm not sure why. Um, so, so I think we have to, to be really careful that we're not blurring things together when we're talking about um, the potential risks and benefits. Um, we, we do have to, um, we do have to, to we, ha we have to bear in mind, you know, we have to offer a quick lesson in 21st century genetics. It's not easy. Um, you know, there, we, you may have heard of polygenic traits, but now geneticists are talking about omnigenic traits. Um, genetics is complicated, and we have to we have to acknowledge that and give a sense of that in our reporting. Um, we have to be I think we have to be aware of history. Um, in the 1960s, IVF, uh, in vitro fertilization, was considered uh, a transgression, horrific. The Pope spoke against it. The majority of Americans were against it, not because of any health dangers, because it was just wrong. And now it's standard practice. So, um, so what does that mean about how maybe future generations will look at CRISPR? Maybe they will look at it as being as obvious to do as vaccination. We have to think seriously about that, about how our values change. Um, and you know, it wouldn't hurt for us to actually to to actually interview a few philosophers. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean that very seriously. Francis Collins this week. Um, was uh, uh, speaking out very strongly against germline CRISPR engineering, <clears throat> saying that essentially it was tampering with, quote, the essence of humanity. Mm -hmm. Essence. <laughs> like, that's philosophy. Mm -hmm. like, how is it that heredity becomes essence? Um, what are the words that scientists themselves are using? Uh, where do they, where, what, are, what is the, the, the kind of uh, the epistemology, the metaphysics behind what they're saying? I think we need to unpack that a bit. Um, so finally, um, you know, we have to do all these things, and in, in the end, I think it's it's just training. I think we're just we're just get where we have our training wheels on, and we're learning how to ride this bike. Because um, as <coughs> some of the stories that won awards tonight show, um, CRISPR germline engineering is pretty straightforward conceptually. Um, we're going to be dealing with issues like, for example, I wouldn't be surprised if. I was so inclined in 20 years, I could take a cheek, cheek scraping, I could have somebody turn the cells from a cheek scraping into sperm and into eggs, fertilize them, and produce an embryo, and I could be both parents to a child. That, I, think, I think it's realistic to think that could happen. You could, you, could, you could produce embryos in the lab and then pluck cells out and make them the parents of a new embryo. So in other words, this would be someone, as one philosopher called it, orphaned at conception. That's, that's the real future we're, we're dealing with. It's going to be really hard to report, so I think we have to get really good at working on the news right now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm going to um, introduce each of our winners, and each of them will make some brief remarks. Um, we have three winners, two runner-ups and one first prize winner. I want to start with uh, one of our runner-ups, Andrew Joseph. Andrew was a general assignment reporter for STAT. He previously worked for the San Antonio Express News and the San Francisco Chronicle. He's covered everything from crime to health policy. He won for his article in STAT News called A Baby with a Disease Gene or No Baby at All. Testing, the subtitle was Testing of Embryos Creates an Ethical Morass. This essay deals with the growing use of pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, which I described to you at the beginning in my early remarks. Um, it's usually, uh, PGD is usually used to identify embryos with no sign of genetic anomaly, so they can be selected for implant implantation. In other words, most often PGD is used to enable prospective parents 
who know they are carriers of genetic conditions to identify embryos that won't carry that gene. Andrew's article put a new twist on this. He explored the ethics of prospective parents choosing to implant an embryo known to contain a, 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 an anomaly. This most often happens when IVF has not resulted in any embryos without genetic anomalies. Therefore, the prospective parents have this choice that was in his title of either implanting this baby with a known disease or disease risk or choosing no baby at all. The principal example in Andrew's article was a case of prospective parents with only one viable embryo at the end of their IVF cycle and it had the BRCA mutation which greatly enhances the likelihood that the child will develop breast or ovarian cancer. So as you can imagine, it raises a number of ethical quandaries, which in his remarks he's going to describe for us. Well so I work for a publication called STAT, and for those of you, hopefully most of you know what that is, um, we started about three years ago. We were started by the owner of the Boston Globe, so we're based in Boston, um, but we cover health and medicine sort of nationally. Um, and as Carl or anyone else can tell you, health reporters, like every week, there's just like an insane number of papers and articles, and like you're just trying to like keep up with them and hopefully not miss an important one so your editors aren't like, why didn't we cover this? And you're like, sorry. Um, but every once in a while, you'll see one that'll just like totally grab you. And this was the case for me the um, Ethics Committee of the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, I may have a word wrong in there, the ASRM. <laughs> Um, put out a paper, an ethics, sort of like a guideline statement about what to do in situations that Millie described. Um, and I just had never really thought about that before because I thought of like PGD um, as something that uh, prospective parents use to avoid um, having a baby with a certain gene variant or a certain disease or something like that. Um, and so it kind of stuck with my mind and I started calling people and calling people and um, trying to find cases of it. Because it is, it is rare. Like again, it's like kind of the minority of, of these cases of uh, use of PGD. But what was interesting to me about it was, um, I raised a couple ethical issues. Um, one was that, so there's like a, so you get you do your PGD, and they say this embryo, let's say it's the only viable embryo that you have made, and you know, you can't do another round of IVF. So this is it. And they say, you're, this it has this gene variant that raises the risk of a certain disease by 75%. Um, I mean, sometimes they'll tell you, like, this kid will have this condition. But let's say it's more like the probabilities are high. Then, like, then what? That doesn't actually tell you what's going to happen to that kid. And so you're kind of facing this decision, like, you know, this kid could have a disease based on the decision I make, or could not have a disease, and what does that mean? Like, how do we balance that? Um, and that's, that's something that's kind of running. Um, coming up is with like consumer genetic tests too, like um, that probably some of you have done. If you, uh, you know, do your cheek swab and you find out you have a variant that raises your risk of some disease in future decades by 75%, like what do you do? So like there is a disconnect I think between all this genetic information that uh, is increasingly reaching the public and like actionable information. Um, and then what I thought was interesting about it was um, in situations like this, um, you, there's a lot of people that have to get on the same page before a decision is made. You have to think about what the clinician is comfortable with because there are cases where a clinician is not comfortable transferring an embryo with certain genetic anomalies, but parents want them to. And so what do you do? And typically what happens is the uh, clinicians might try to explain, like, this is a really bad idea, this kid will have all these issues, they'll be really sick, it might not lead to an actual successful pregnancy. Um, they might have them meet with genetic counselors, but if they're still not on the same page, the clinician might have to like actually move the embryo to another clinic where the clinician is more comfortable doing that. And sometimes if you have a couple, they might not agree either with what to do. Uh, so you have like parents disagreeing over the fate of their embryo. And then lastly, you're thinking about what at that point is like just a bundle of frozen cells somewhere that uh, doesn't really have agency, but you're trying to think about what's like ethically right to do with that child or potential child that might or may not exist depending on your decision. And then lastly, um, what was really interesting, I think, about this issue is that like, the paper basically from the Ethics Committee outlined like there are certain conditions that if the kid is going to be really sick or not live long or have like, like extreme disabilities, like it is not ethical to transfer that embryo. But that's some things. There's a whole host of genetic variants or chromosomal issues that come up where there's not, it's just like a gray area. And so it gets into a question of, I mean, some people don't actually like the term genetic anomaly um, because it suggests that something is wrong with you if you have that variant. 
Um, and so in case, so for example, like there are examples of two uh, parents who are both deaf who want to select for a child with deafness. And to a lot of people be like, why, that kid is gonna have a disability, he's, he's gonna have a hard life. But think of it from their perspective, they've lived their whole life deaf and have probably great lives and found a, a partner who is also deaf and they lead like a wonderful life together. And so they want their kid to have a similar life to them and so they can kind of be with each other. And there's some doctors who think that is wrong to select for and won't do it. Um, there's same things um, with dwarfism, there are examples of that. Um, but as Millie was saying, the case I wrote about was these two women, this married couple, um, one woman who felt like a very strong biological pull to have, to become pregnant, to have a genetic child. She had this BRAC mutation, which raised her risk of um, having ovarian or breast cancer, like to a pretty high like rate. Um, and she was in her late 30s, and there were, she had a number of relatives who had actually died of ovarian cancer at their early 40s. So they said, you have one shot at this, we're gonna do one egg retrieval cycle, and then you're gonna have your ovaries out. And so, she, and then they used a sperm donor, and sort of all the eggs that came out, and their, um, with, like, with the IVF, they had one embryo that worked, or that was potentially viable. And so it was a hard decision for them, because, um, you know, and it, the, the one advantage was that it was actually a male embryo, um, and so the risk of cancer is still elevated, but not quite as high as if it had been a female embryo. Um, but you know, they were keeping it in their family line then, and so they were, and they were thinking, is this really worth it to have a biological child for this woman to have a biological child to go through all this? And they eventually just, and they got some pushback from some people, but their doctor was on board, and so uh, they ended up having a child who's now three and totally fine, and um, they will one day tell him that you have a mutation that raises your risk of cancer, and if you have a daughter, it's something to think about because you could pass it on to her. And so um, it gets actually also back to what Carl was saying that like these are people sort of dealing with these issues like in their it's happening like these people are having to make these decisions and they're rare but they could become more common and like sort of the array of of questions people face will probably just become more complicated as technology advances. So, um, you know, and we, we, as health reporters, we often might want to write about real people facing real decisions because it's more people like the general public connects with it. It's more, frankly, like dramatic from a st storytelling purpose. So, um, and that's actually what's maybe the hardest thing about the story was finding a couple willing to talk about it. So um, I'm grateful to them. I'm grateful to all the real people who are willing to talk with me about their health problems because ask a lot of questions and it's very personal. Um, and I'm grateful to the scientists and ethicists who explain all these things to me. Thanks to the Hastings Center and thanks to all of you for caring about us. And now I'd like to introduce our other uh, runner-up, Amber Vance. Amber is a freelance science writer based in Southern California. She contributes to publications including PNAS for Matter, The Scientist, and Nature. She has a doctorate in biology, and she studied journalism because <coughs> she, she wanted to write about her broad interest in science for the public. Amber won for a long essay in Nature Biotechnology called Simply Better Beings? Question mark in which she explored a wide range of ethical questions raised by the prospect of human germline modification. Um, in contrast, um, her essay lays out the current legal status um, of making heritable changes to the human genome in numerous countries around the world. And then she identified a wide set of ethical concerns, which she explains beautifully, um, revealing the range of views that reasonable people hold about the wisdom of undertaking germline editing. I want to just take a moment to acknowledge my editor, um, Laura DeFrancesco at Nature Biotechnology, who assigned this piece and shepherded it through to production. I want to take a moment to acknowledge the judges. I know it's so hard to comb through so many entries and try and just pick a few. Thank you. Um, and I want to thank the Hastings Center and the Templeton Foundation for putting together these awards and this event. I really hope that when journalists win awards, it's not just about a couple people who make it up on the podium that particular year, but that it serves to remind all of us science journalists that the work we're doing is valued, and it is important, and that we should keep it up. So thank you. 
I wrote my article last summer, end of the summer, in the wake of some news out of Oregon that scientists had managed to use CRISPR to genetically edit human embryos. Not, not for babies, just embryos. They created a gene for a heart defect. And I spoke with several ethicists you know, about what issues this would raise, and I'll lay those out. Um, of course, as we all have learned, well, um, they told me at the time that there were still some technical challenges to work out, there were still some safety issues to work out, and, and that was supposed to give us time as a society to figure out where we're going to draw the lines and what's right and what's wrong. Um, and of course, we all know that time is kind of up, <laughs> which of course just makes the work of people and organizations like the Hastings Center even more important. As I read Andrew and Antonio's work, I was really struck by the contrast between the personal sides of this issue and the global sides of this issue. You know, per on the personal side, you have a couple who desire a child, a healthy child, their child, and that is completely understandable. But those, that couple isn't the only people in the equation. You also have the third person, this potential child. You know, if I decide to go and get gene editing and change cells in my skin or my liver or whatever, that's it's up to me. I'm a grown up. I can consent to that. A ball of cells can't consent. So, you know, what if my parents picked blue eyes, but oh, I wish it was green? Or what if my parents went for the super smarts package, but I wanted super strength or, or super speed? And if that sounds a little far out, well, what if they decided to get editing to fix the Brca mutation or some other risk-causing gene, but there was some mistake, something went wrong, and they gave me some other problem. I mean, Teenagers have enough to be mad at their parents about <laughs> without adding this, right? And the thing is, it's not just about those three people either. It's about all of us, because we all share a gene pool. We are all part of this huge tapestry of humanity with crazy multicolored threads from all of the genes we have. And it's not so straightforward to say, well, I'm going to pull this thread out, pull that thread out, don't need that one. The reason for that is that a lot of genes aren't black and white, bad and good. There's a lot of gray. Um, the classic example is the sickle cell anemia gene that Carl brought up. Sickle cell anemia is bad. Blocks blood vessels, causes organ damage, it causes death, and it kills babies. But one copy of the sickle cell gene can give you some resistance against malaria. There's places in the world where that's good. And it's thought that that's why that gene has persisted in the human genome. Another gray gene is actually the HIV resistance gene. You might think, well, not being able to get HIV, that sounds pretty good. One less thing to worry about, nothing else. But to get that, you're mucking around with your immune system. I don't know about you, but I like my immune system functioning at like full capacity. And you're changing actually a gene that seems to be important for fighting off flu, West Nile disease, um, other things. So you are are you starting to weigh, well, which disease is my baby more likely to be exposed to at some point in their life? So it's not just as straightforward as saying this gene is bad, get rid of it. Because we don't even know everything about the human genome, everything about disease, to really be able to make those decisions today. And the thing is, the decisions that we make about our gene pool can have far-reaching, unexpected consequences. So before anybody thought about CRISPR or gene editing, Decades ago, China had a population pro problem, and so they implemented their one-child policy. And population growth went down. Now they have a pretty good proportion of elderly people and a smaller population to look after them. And there was also a genetic preference that people implemented in this one-child policy. It was a genetic preference for a Y chromosome with the result that now they have a skew, skewed sex ratio and the fact that there's been a rise in violent crime in that nation has been blamed by some for because there's too many men. Another issue my sources brought up is what Carl mentioned on um, the idea of the haves and have-nots. We have this huge disparity in wealth and resources already. So say everybody in Israel gets CRISPR edited to perfection and everybody in Ireland doesn't. You know, what happens to a kid who grows up in Ireland and moves to Israel and is surrounded by these super healthy Amazons? Um, and then as others have raised, you know, what do we edit? What constitutes something that should be fixed? 
part of our tapestry of humanity is people who have all kinds of abilities and disabilities. And people with disabilities can lead wonderful, fulfilling lives, and they enrich the lives of those around them. I know that's happened to me personally and my family. They teach us compassion. So where would we even draw the line? Uh, my sources, last year they told me what we're looking for is a broad public consensus. <laughs> Nobody knows exactly what that means. <laughs> and we live in a world where we can't even agree, like, is Coke better or Pepsi better? So I'm not really sure how we're all going to agree on something like this. There will be people who say, absolutely no, no way, it just doesn't sit well with me, it doesn't work with my beliefs, and there will be people who say, sounds good. Um, and even if we did have a consensus, I don't know who's going to oversee that. Uh, as was mentioned, China had guidelines against using research embryos for pregnancy, and that doesn't seem to have stopped people. I think you know all we can do is just keep talking about it, so I look forward to our discussion. Thank you. first place winner, Antonio Regalado. Antonio is the senior editor for Biomedicine at MIT Technology Review. Previously, he wrote about science, technology, and politics in Latin America for science and for other publications. And from 2000 to 2009, he was the science reporter at the Wall Street Journal, Journal and later a foreign correspondent for them. He won for an article entitled, A New Way to Reproduce, which describes scientific advances in the making of human gametes, eggs, sperm, and eggs and sperm, from other cells, such as skin cells, something similar to what Carl was describing in the, uh, as futuristic. But yes, we really are on the cusp of being able to do that, to take someone's skin cells, reprogram them back to being stem cells, and from there, prompt them to develop into sperm or eggs. This is called gametogenesis, the making of gametes, and it has already been done successfully in mice, for example. In Japan, mice have been born from eggs that scientists created from the cells in the mouse's tail, as one example. Antonio's piece talks about the social and ethical implications if we ever do get good at easily producing eggs and sperm in the laboratory for human reproduction. Um, there's a line in, in your essay that I really loved and I'm going to remember, so I'm going to read it for others. Um, he said, recreating these human eggs and sperm would give scientists access to the chamber of secrets where the links between the generations are forged. Since writing this article, Antonio has been involved in very recent riveting news. You've already heard that, he, that we are, were pleased that the person who broke this story about Dr. He was here with us tonight. Um, he reported that the fetuses had been gestating, see if I got this right, gestating at least six months, and then within hours of Antonio's report, the Associated Press disclosed that these fetuses had actually developed further and had been born as twin girls. This set off the firestorm of discussion that you may have seen in the press, recriminations, justifications, and, and outrage, and applause, all of it. And Antonio has agreed to talk not so much about his paper, and to any extent you want to, uh, about artificial gametes, but also to tell us a little bit about the behind-the-scenes story of how he broke that story. Sometimes after doing a really long, a lot of work on a story, I have a 10-year-old daughter, and we play board games, and so then I start to think, yeah, right. I made this myself, you can see. <laughs> My Zyko is totally rubbish, but like a, a recruiting call from China, who knows? Um, yeah, I spent a month on a story, and I have this 10 year old daughter, she likes board games, and so sometimes I end up thinking, like, you know, what would be the board game version of this story? And we heard from Amber and others about, you know, all these lines that we draw in the sand. So don't cross that line, don't cross that line. Um, so I thought maybe the board game could be kind of maybe it could be good, crossing the line. <laughs> Two people would kind of move around and somehow force each other into different positions, or maybe it's bioethics twister, you know, <laughs> got to keep adopting new positions and the last person standing is in good shape. So this is, this is the technology, or this is the technology space that I've been looking into um, since really 1998, so I'm especially glad uh, to be here. Uh, the germline. What is the germline? Um, for people who don't know, sperm and the egg, they form this single cell together, the two nuclei go in, that's the zygote, and then it develops, there's the embryo, 
uh, a person, and then that person generates new um, germ cells. Here, a man, it could be a woman, then with eggs, and then the process repeats. So, what is happening in science is that um, this process is being broken down to its sort of fundamental elements, right? Um, and that is very powerful because even though you and I and the red man here uh, won't live forever, the cells are continuous, right? I mean, barring natural catastrophe, the secret of immortality, of regeneration, um, is here. And people, what people are doing is they're investigating these steps, trying to recapitulate each of these steps in the laboratory to extract those secrets and turn them into technology. And so we talk about Facebook and our phones. So the prospect is as of a technology that is as profound as that. But first we've got to turn to technology. And so that's what's happened in China is, is the first sort of kind of clumsy step to use a particular iteration of this technology. You can see it here. Here's the zygote. Or actually, this is the egg. It's being held by a kind of a suction pipette. And someone's injecting a sperm cell. And along with it, the ingredients for CRISPR. So this is exactly what they did to um, edit this gene. Here's Hu Jiang Kui, as best I can say it. He has a nickname, JK. He put out kind of a promotional video. You've got to watch this. It's the He Lab on YouTube. I mean, it's really surreal. The whole thing is utterly surreal. So of course, his uh, news has been trickling out, actually. The week ahead of this summit, the second global summit to decide, should we cross the line, right, yeah. uh, is about to occur, and his information is trickling out. It has gotten to the leadership of the summit, uh, to some journalists, and so it's about to break, and it finally does, right before the summit. Uh, here's the media crush. Um, the people who were at the summit said they'd never seen so many you know, media at the summit. It was a big crowd. Here he is, the man himself, walking on the stage. Um, Here's Jennifer Doudna, or Doudna, I'm never sure how to pronounce it. She's kind of uh, the co-discoverer of CRISPR and has ra been raising alarms. You can look at the very alarmed look on her face. I mean, she spent probably three days like looking like this, like, holy <laughs> smokes. And, and then on Twitter, you know, it's a very like 21st century uh, thing that's happening here. And then on Twitter, there's a, just a furious commentary. Here's Eric Topol, probably the nation's leading cardiologist, uh, medicine. precision medicine guy. He came down on this very strong and clean in the New York Times. I've never written anything with the word condemn, reckless, and unethical, but they're all warranted. He actually was one of the people with early access to the facts, because I think the AP had sent him the paper. Here's Matthew Cobb. Complete fuck up. <laughs> um, I mean, the facts here, when you look at them, uh, are not good, right? This, these embryos were totally normal, and then were mutated. Someone is here. Is, Someone in this room is, has a project on what words people use to describe things. Mutated. <laughs> it's a bad one. Uh, although scientifically precise, you know, mutate a normal embryo to achieve some effect. I mean, they're calling him China's Dr. Frankenstein. You know, come up with your um, analogy. It's a complete mess, a scientific race that ends up with, you know, just an experiment that is not really ethical. But um, it is the way things are headed, at least in terms of the technology. And a lot of people for a while have known that this is going to happen. This is an article we're about to publish, and it's called Crossing the Gene Line, the, the Germ Line. And um, we have this kind of table of events, and this is kind of like the ine inexorable steps, the ine inexorable steps, and how fast they're moving to Carl's point. 2012, invention of CRISPR or uh, discovery of the CRISPR system. Within six months, it's the first mice. And I talked to someone in China, and like, the mice were made at MIT. And they said, we lost the mouse. Mm -hmm. uh, two minutes left. We lost the mouse, but we won the goat, the sheep, and the monkey. It was a race. <laughs> they were just churning through all the species. I don't know what kind of bioethics tradition they have, but it's apparently not one that drew a line around the human embryo. So 20, 2014, this guy, Huang Junju, I'm not saying his name very well, that's his name, uh, he edited a human embryo. It was easy to do, he said. It was really easy. It took six months. It wasn't a very complex experiment. 
He just did it. He didn't ask anybody's permission. I mean, local ethics board maybe, but there was no global conversation. He just did it. The reaction to his paper on the embryo was very similar to the reaction that we're seeing today. Outrage, you know, fear. Um, and he just kind of disappeared off the map. And so last October, or in October, I went to China. I said, I'm going to find this guy and find out what his story was. Because he disappeared, I wanted to find out had he been punished by the government or what was going on. So then in 2015, we do have the statement it would be irresponsible to make the baby. 2016, U.S. government says CRISPR is a weapon of mass destruction. <laughs> in the National Intelligence Estimate, Exhibit A, Dr. Huang's report. 2017, National Academies changes their tune. Don't do it, but it's actually okay to do someday. <laughs> Dr. He is listening in Shenzhen. Two months later, literally, he files his uh, request to do the trial, citing the U.S. National Academy's approval. And so that's the story up till now. <laughs> Check it out.